Welcome to the Technical Online Policy Seminar. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from Ohio State University, and Justin White from University of California, San Francisco. The goal of TOPS is to provide a free multidisciplinary international forum for research using experimental or quasi-experimental variation to study nicotine tobacco policies with a particular interest in emerging tobacco products and modified risk tobacco products. This forum is designed to bring together key stakeholders with the goal of breaking silos in tobacco policy research and providing a platform for high quality research to be discussed and disseminated. The, the ultimate goal of the forum is to facilitate the, the production and sharing of knowledge that can be used to develop an effective tobacco policy framework. TOPS will have a seminar every other Friday. Seminar talks will generally follow one of three formats. One, a traditional presentation of a single paper. Two, a grand round style presentation of the presenter's research around a common theme. Or three, a workshop in which the presenter provides new tools or knowledge for tobacco policy researchers. Today's presentation will be a workshop presentation. We have lined up preeminent researchers to present during the first five seminars after which we hope to select presenters from among submissions to our online portal. We welcome submissions from faculty, postdocs, students, and non-academics. Our only restriction is that we intend to feature research that uses an experimental or quasi-experimental design, that is, studies in which there is a clearly defined counterfactual. The seminar will be one hour in length with questions asked by the moderator and discussants during and after the presentation. The audience may pose questions, comments in the Q&A feature and the moderator will draw from these questions, comments, and conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. In short, please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website at a later date. Now I will turn it over to today's moderator, Justin White of University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. I'm pleased to introduce our inaugural TOPS presenter, Dr. Jean-Francois Etter. Dr. Etter will be leading a workshop style presentation entitled The Gateway Effect and Electronic Cigarettes. Dr. Etter is a professor of public health in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. He has a PhD in political science and is an internationally recognized expert in the study of tobacco dependence and the development and evaluation of interventions to prevent smoking. He's a pioneer in research on electronic cigarettes. He's the author of over 160 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Our discussants today are Dr. C. Shang of The Ohio State University and Dr. Terry Pahachik of Georgia State University. Dr. Ter, thank you for agreeing to present today. I turn it over to you. Thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation and hello to everybody. I'm very glad to see that there are so many people present today. Um, so I will present today um, talk about the gateway effects uh, and uh, it, it's uh, based on an article that I published in the journal Addiction uh, two years ago. So I will share my screen now. Um, so um, to start uh, my disclosure slide, uh, there were no sources of funding for this study. My salary is paid by the University of Geneva. I uh, received no uh, funding from the tobacco industry, but uh, seven years ago in 2013, I traveled to China to visit e-cigarette factories and to talk with uh, the managers of a factory. They, they paid for my plane ticket and hotel nights there. So the gateway theory. It's, uh, it's an old theory that dates back to the 1970s when it was used to support the idea that marijuana causes heroin use. It's not uh, really a scientific theory. Rather, it's a mix of popular journalistic uh, uh, and academic accounts. And it has always been controversial, even for marijuana and heroin. 
Uh, why uh, does the gateway theory matter? Because it has enormous political influence. For instance, if you take the tobacco products directive that, uh, from the European Union that uh, uh, sets the framework for member states uh, to develop their own tobacco product laws, it says that electronic cigarettes can develop into a gateway to nicotine addiction and for this reason, it is appropriate to adopt a restrictive approach. So it, it is a pillar of, of this directive, actually. And of course, this theory is a central argument of opponents to uh, new vaporization technologies. Uh, they argue that not only e could lead to smoking, but could also lead to illicit drug use. So let's examine this theory, uh, look at um, how you can establish that there is such a gateway and uh, whether there are proofs uh, of, of such an effect. It's a causal theory, it's a theory of a, of a causal effect and it's very useful in this case to go back to an old paper of 1965 by the British epidemiologist Austin Bradford Hill uh, and in a short paper he described um, nine aspects or viewpoints, as he calls them, to assess whether there is a causal relation. He says that none of these nine points will be sufficient to establish causality, but if many of them are present, we'll be reassured that there might be a causal effect. So the first criteria is the strength of the association. Then there's the consistency of results across trials, investigators, and, and, and replications of the studies then there's a specificity of the, of the effect. Do we know if the effect can be caused by other things? Then we, do we know whether the cause is precedes the effect? Do we have temporal data? Is there a dose, a dose response? I mean, does the response increase if the dose of the cause increases? Is it plausible? Is there a biological or a psychological explanation? Is, is it coherent? I mean, is it consistent with other lines of evidence, other sorts of studies? Can we conduct experiments in, in this field? Experiments means randomized controlled trials. And then there's analogy. Do similar agents, like for instance, uh, other nicotine products, act similarly? So let's start with the, uh, the experimentation. It's, it's clearly not feasible to uh, randomly assign young people to, to vape. So uh, we need to rely on observational data. And uh, for this reason, we, we need good uh, longitudinal observational studies with a reliable assessment of the behaviors, smoking and vaping, assessed at the right time, because we want to assess antecedents, and we want to assess a non-repeatable event, which is smoking uptake. It's an event that occurs only once, so difficult to capture, difficult to capture. Of course, since it's not experimental, we need an assessment of confounders and an, a comprehensive assessment, not just a short list of confounders, but a comprehensive list of all the plausible confounders. And we also need sophistical data analysis to eliminate the effect of these confounders. But of course, uh, the data that we have is, uh, comes mostly from self-reports in questionnaires by teenagers, and we know that these are often unreliable. And statisticians will tell you that even small rates of misclassification will make adjustment for confounders uh, problematic. So John, uh, yes. if you don't mind, can I interrupt here? Uh, sure. So um, thinking about gateway effects, can you be uh, more clear about the definition of a gateway effect? So from okay. a population health perspective, uh, there will be population, especially youth, who would otherwise um, not, not, uh, not going to uh, start smoking if there is no uh, e-cigarettes. So I just want to make sure that uh, we are clear about the definition of gateway effect here. Um, yes, of course. Um, uh, pretty much what the tobacco products directive states here is what most people will uh, understand uh, as gateway effect. Mm -hmm. uh, use of one product in, 
in this case e-cigarettes, will uh, cause nicotine addiction or will be a cause of people starting smoking uh, cigarettes later. That's, that's what the gateway effect means. Mm -hmm. And um, another question regarding the confounders. Um, so you mentioned that we need a comprehensive set of confounders. Yes. And um, I uh, think most of the studies, they do adjust for confounders when they analyze gateway effect. Can you be more specific about uh, the confounders that may not be have been controlled? Yes, we'll come back to that later. Okay. Yes, it's a very good question. It's an excellent question. It's, it's actually, it's a central question here. We, we will come back to this. And if, I, if at the end of the presentation, I have not answered your question, you may come back with the question. Okay? Sure. Uh, yeah, I, uh, let me, uh, uh, I know we're gonna get there and let me just state that uh, the the central uh, argument is that uh, it's not just the measured confounders, impulsivity, or risk taking, or other kind of personal traits, but the general concept that some adolescents would become smokers irrespective of any involvement with vaping, and so the degree to which we can eliminate the plausibility that all of the linkage between vaping history and initiation of smoking is in the cohort who would have become smokers anyway is the central challenge in this type of analysis. Exactly, it's very, very well explained. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, another, viewpoint, as uh, Bradford Hill uh, said, is the strength of the association. It's, uh, any association will be more credible or plausible if, if it has a certain strength. And um, so because our measures are imprecise, it, it's going to be very difficult to detect uh, and measure small effects. So the effects will, be, will need to be large enough in order to be detectable because we are relying mostly on questionnaires uh, and observational data self-reported by, by teenagers. And um, another point also is, well, relatively few non-smokers have taken up smoking. So a population effect, so the, I mean, the relative risk applied to the number of users is likely to be relatively small but this may, cha this may change, of course, with the arrival of new products and uh, new uh, marketing techniques. Um, sorry for interrupting again, yes. but uh, can you be again more specific about uh, the small effect size? Because um, theoretically, we can use power analysis to calculate the sample size that is needed to detect a certain effect size. So, exactly. yeah. So, can exactly. you? Exactly. Yeah. 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 You're, you're perfectly right. If you have samples large enough, very, like the very large surveys that are conducted in particular in the US in, uh, in teens, then you can compensate, of course, for the imprecision of, of the measure by the sample size to some, to some extent, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, I mean, in terms of the existing literature, there is um, some estimates regarding the association between um, using e-cigarettes and future cigarette smoking. So the effect size that they measure are between three and four times uh, if you look at all ratios. So that's pretty large effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, yes. Yeah. Well, th then it's debatable whether these odds ratios are really actual because uh, again, uh, we come to the adjustment for okay. confounders. It's not always certain that they had a very long list of confounders. Um, the consistency across trials, across even investigators, population methods, is, is, is a very strong criteria, I think, to, to, to be confident that an effect is real if you find it in, in different papers coming from different sources, different countries, etc. The problem here that we have a wide variation of results in the published papers and a very good predictor of the conclusions of a paper is the author's name, uh, his past publications, his, his opinion. So there's, it's a, 
it's a hotly debated topic. It's not the only one in public health. We, we, there are many, many areas in public health that are very uh, hotly debated. There's ideological bias, I would say, on both sides. And uh, this also limits our ability to um, draw conclusions, I think. And also, another additional difficulty is that the label e-cigarettes covers not a single product, but a wide variety of products. There's a constant flow of new products. It's a very innovative sector. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese um, managers of these companies are usually very young and very competitive, and, and this competition leads to, uh, to many, many uh, new things all the time. So um, this also uh, has uh, uh, as a consequence that uh, the studies are rapidly obsolete. And also another point is that the uh, vaping in, in teenagers depends on a lot of factors that change all the time. They, they vary over time and they vary also geographically from one country to another, from one place to another. Uh, so uh, the nicotine content and delivery, the product characteristics, uh, the access to the product, uh, the marketing techniques, the marketing campaigns, the social media, the regulation differ from one country to the next, the information to the public, the social context, the prevalence of vaping and smoking, anti-smoking campaigns, etc. All these things change and vary. So, the object of our research, the behavior of kids, is really very hard to capture because this object is, is you know, varies and changes all the time and, and varies across places, it makes things uh, more difficult to analyze. So the results of studies may not be generalizable to other countries or population groups. Uh, they are often unreliable and, and rapidly obsolete, and unreliable because of the ideological bias of so many authors. It's an additional difficulty in this field. Uh, yes. But right, but science deals with these kind of issues all the time. And John Simon and I, when in the 2014 Surgeon General Report dealing with the consistency of, let's say, smoking causing diabetes, had mm -hmm. to deal with the issues that there were good studies and bad studies. And one of the aspects of the Surgeon General process uh, is not to just rely upon uh, poorly, poorly done meta analysis or things that are. Uh, putting good and bad studies together just to increase sample size. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have to look at the best available uh, set of, uh, of studies. You know, and sometimes that is uh, viewed as a ideological bias, but if we have strict rules about saying, what are the best uh, set uh, of data? And that we're excluding maybe two thirds of the studies for uh, objectively defined reasons, uh, there's a history on us having to do that in other content areas. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a, it's a way to defend yourself against, uh, against these ideologically biased studies by, by setting methodological criteria and, and eliminating the, the bad apples, the bad studies. Uh, but can we completely eliminate this problem? It's, it's going to be difficult, I think. The specificity, can we exclude that other things cause smoking? And here we have an additional difficulty in the fact that the two behaviors that we are assessing are very, very similar and very close. In both cases, it's about inhaling something that contains nicotine with the gestures and flavors uh, that, that often are tobacco flavors, for instance. So the, the, the two behaviors are very, very close, uh, very similar, and they are determined by the same causes. So it's gonna be difficult to disentangle the uh, specific uh, causal effect of vaping uh, towards smoking and all the underlying causes of the two behaviors. For instance, social influences, the fact that family and friends uh, smoke or vape, personality traits, uh, risk taking, novelty seeking, the use of other tobacco products, the use of other drugs, behavioral problems and psychological problems that are strongly associated with substance use, as you know, even genetic factors that are causes of both behaviors. So you need to have a, a, 
a comprehensive assessment and measurement of all these elements and imagine that if you want to cover all these all this list correctly you need to have a very very long questionnaire and you need to measure these things with valid questionnaires in teams uh, it, it's a great difficulty in this field i hope i have answered the the, the formal question about so about dr Atter, um yeah. just to jump in so first of all for people who join late this is justin white from ucsf i'm the moderator our discussants today are dr c shang from the ohio state university and dr terry pahachik uh, from Georgia State University, who was the one who asked the last question. Um, there was one question here about uh, confounding specifically and whether uh, given the complexity of um, the predictors that affect both smoking and vaping, mm -hmm. is it ever possible to fully adjust for, for confounding and given the, the complexity of those relationships? Uh, it's, it's a very good point. And um, in my next slide, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, it's going to be very difficult to eliminate all the uh, variability in propensity to smoke that is captured by the variable vaping. You know, when vaping captures a lot of the variance in in, in smoking. So um, even I think with the best statistical model and and even with the best measurement, it's going to be very hard to eliminate. Um, the common uh, causality and uh, vaping will still predict smoking even after the best possible adjustment. It's a central point. The point uh, that is the unavoidable presence of residual confounding in this field. I, I mean, it's, it's very central to understand that. And when you look at these observations and studies, the first thing is to jump to the method section and look at what confounders they measured. Much of the time, it's a secondary analysis of data collected for other purposes, and you have a very brief list of confounders and not the comprehensive list that's behind the, the small uh, list I have here. I mean, um. personality traits, you can use uh, 200 questions questionnaire just to assess personality. So this point I think, I think is central because we are relying on observational studies with statistical adjustments there will always be uh, or in most cases will be residual confounding if i may uh, jump in with one follow-up yeah. question here sorry see yeah. um mm. the, there's a, a question about is using quasi-experimental methods like e-cigarette policy adoption uh to predict initial e-cigarette use a way to get around um or get beyond the, the common liability problem and a, a related question was something around like, for example, the curiosity that's created by uh, uh, e-cigarette advertising, you know, maybe you could use that as other, another source of variation to, to get around this. So are, are there ways to get around the confounding issue? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very good point. I, I, I can do it later, but uh, absolutely. There are natural experiments, like for instance, uh, the introduction of uh, regulations on, on the prices or prohibitions to sell uh, e-cigarettes to, to kids. All these natural experiments can be used uh, to assess the effect of, uh, of these measures that limit, for instance, access to e-cigarettes in kids. And then you can look in comparative studies, in before, after studies, look at the effect of these measures on, on vaping and smoking. It's a very good uh, way to proceed, but you, you, you need to have your study ready at, at the moment when the new regulation enters in force, and, and it's not always obvious, but uh, yes, it's, it's a very good point, yes. Um, I have another um, comment. Yeah, and, and what is... Hmm? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have another comment regarding methodology. So I've seen studies that use propensity scores to match yes. youth um, who are naive to uh, cigarettes, uh, that they have tried e-cigarettes with uh, the rest of the, uh, the youth to emphasize the gateway effect. Can you comment on that? Do you yes, think propensity absolutely. scores absolutely. It's a good way. It's been used. It's been used to assess the uh, effects of, uh, for instance, uh, marijuana to, uh, towards uh, heroin use or um, smokeless tobacco propensity scores, it's a, it's a questionnaire or a score that assess a propensity to smoke. And, and this is a way to, uh, uh, 
to, to do this, absolutely, yes. Yeah, uh, however, they also found that there is association between e-cigarette use and future smoking after using propensity smoking. Ap after adjustment for yeah, propensity yeah. smoking, absolutely, absolutely. So then uh, the temporality... Yeah, to bring, to br uh, yeah, to bring back one, uh, kind of a, 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 one of the things about from the last, last, last couple of discussions that uh, is the, uh, uh, the fact that some of this challenge uh, relates to the effect size, and there may be a, a, a range of error in terms of effect size, but when there's multiple sources of evidence and when there's multiple methods, that the uh, confidence in the causal link uh, becomes stronger, uh, meaning <coughs> we don't we aren't able to predict the magnitude of additional smokers uh, with a high degree of certainty, but a high confidence that it is contributing to the smoking epidemic. Those are uh, complementary but not equal things. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Then the, the um, criterion of temporality, we must make sure that the cause precedes the effect. And uh, it's very hard to establish antecedents when product use co occur or occur at about the same time. And uh, again, this is based on self-report of past behaviors. Much of the time it's, uh, we ask, these questionnaires ask kids to remember what they did six months ago, so what's the reliability of this. And uh, another argument is that the sequence of products used can often be explained by the sequence of opportunities to use this product. Kids or anyone is going to use the product that's most available around him or her. A and this sequence of opportunities to use this product will determine the sequence of product use um, rather than an inherent capacity of vaping to cause smoking. So I'm not saying that there's no capacity of vaping to cause smoking, but that the sequence of opportunities uh, to use the product must be taken into account also and assessed somehow. Um, so we have a lot of these uh, observational studies that document two of the uh, of the viewpoints of, uh, of Bradford Hill, which are antecedents and increased relative risk of smoking. We have a lot of this. Of this. Increased relative risk of smoking in kids who, who vaped compared to those who never vaped, and the antecedents of the behavior of vaping compared with smoking. So is it enough to conclude to uh, a gateway effect? Not quite, because uh, you still have the problem of eliminating uh, the confounding factors, uh, even after statistical adjustment. And as I said, few of the studies have a, really a comprehensive assessment of, uh, of confounders and are longitudinal, not, not just cross-sectional. And there's doubts also about the plausibility of the gateway theory that I, may, that I will come to later. So many of these observational studies use data collected for other purposes, data that were already collected, and the list of confounders, as I said, is, is too short. And uh, also there's uh, an additional issue that in order for the theory to be really convincing, you would need, I think, to have a measure of the duration and the intensity of the initial vaping and the subsequent smoking. So uh, is a single puff on, on, on an e-cigarette or on a cigarette sufficient to establish the, this, this theory? Is it what we're looking for? Or are we looking for regular smoking? I think there's no consensus among the people who look at these things on what exactly uh, is sufficient to, uh, to take political action. I mean, you can have a statistical effect, but what is the level of the problem that is sufficient to, uh, to take political action uh, in terms of the, uh, the size of the effect, but also the effect that, that we are interested in? Is it regular smoke?
thing is it just one path on, on, on a cigarette. So there are many reasons to think that the theory is plausible. We come to plausibility now. Of course, smoking and vaping share the same gestures. Uh, the inhalation, uh, it's, it's, there's a model called the route of administration model, you know, the, the taste, the, uh, all the practice of inhaling vapor or smoke, the contact with smokers in outdoor uh, smoking areas, for instance, uh, and also, of course, some changes in the brain, uh, for instance, in the number of nicotine receptors and the possibility to get addicted to nicotine, uh, even though it's not well established now whether vaping or pure nicotine can cause addiction. Uh, but, but there are some data emerging now. So uh, fortunately, um, most of the e-cigarette models that uh, people use are not ex as addictive as cigarettes, but this may change uh, with the uh, recent model using nicotine salts, of course, that deliver nicotine at about the same speed to the brain as smoking. So th these things, th these devices may be more addictive than older devices. Uh, uh, John, so the uh, National Ac Academies of uh, Science, Engineering and Medicine report, uh, they did say that there is substantial evidence that uh, e-cigarette use result in symptoms of dependence on nicotine. Can you comment on that? Because here you say uh, it's not very addictive, but there uh, is yes, the... uh, say showing uh, dependence. Yes, but what, the, what this uh, report from, from two years ago concluded is that, as you said, there's substantial evidence that uh, e-cigarettes use by use increases the risk of ever using uh, cigarettes, that is using cigarettes once, uh, one cigarette or a few puffs on a cigarette. There's moderate evidence that uh, vaping increases not only experimentation, but the frequency and intensity uh, of uh, subsequent smoking. And there's limited evidence, uh, according to this report, that e-cigarette use increases the duration of uh, subsequent smoking. But they also said later in the report that it's unclear whether this increase in ever use results in uh, increased initiation to, to regular smoking. So uh, perhaps because at this point, uh, the data uh, were too short term to establish whether these kids would turn into adults, regular smokers. Mm -hmm. But yes, it, as you say, there's, there's a disagreement between the experts. As I said, the NASM report, the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine concludes that uh, yes, there, there is uh, an effect uh, on the intensity, frequency, and duration of smoking, but they have not established whether this turns into um, the initiation of regular smoking when these kids reach the adult age. Uh, then you have other reports that are also authoritative, like for instance, the uh, report of Public Health England, who conclude differently. They, they say that the causal link has not been established and neither has progression to regular smoking and that the common liability hypothesis applies. And you also have another authoritative report that dates back to 2016. So it's, it's uh, four years old and it's in this field, it's, it's a lot because many, many public studies were published since then. Um, and they also conclude that uh, concerns over gateway progression into smoking are unfounded. But as I said, the experts um, disagree on, on this. Uh, it, it may also be the case that um, uh, things are different in the UK and in the US. In the UK, they regulate e-cigarettes differently from, from the US. And uh, uh, it, they have, I think, uh, small, uh, fewer problems with teens vaping than in the, than in the US. So, uh, it may also, uh, I think, influence uh, this report. But then, um, yes, uh, let, let me continue to the um, plausibility issues. There are also 
a few arguments against this plausibility. For instance, that cigarettes are everywhere. There's actually no need for any gateway for kids to use them because they are so omnipresent. And then why would people who choose to vape rather than smoke change their mind and start smoking? They could just vape different and better products. And uh, there are, of course, observations of kids who first vape, then smoke. But most of the time, people smoke first and then switch to vaping because they look for alternatives to smoking that are either safer or cheaper or more socially acceptable. Then there's the uh, also important argument or viewpoint of coherence. Is, it, is this effect consistent with other lines of evidence? For instance, is it consistent with the uh, historical trends trends in vaping and smoking. So in the US and in the UK, there's a continuous decrease in smoking in kids. Here you have data from ASH, Action on Smoking and Health, which show, which, which show that uh, in recent years, smoking prevalence has continued to decrease in kids, even though uh, vaping slightly increased. Well, vaping increased uh, between 2013 and 16, 17, then well, it's rather stable. But uh, this increase in vaping is not translated into an increase in uh, smoking. In the US too, uh, e-cigarettes became popular a few years ago. And uh, if anything, the downward trend in uh, smoking prevalence in kids in, uh, accelerated in the last few years, rather than decelerated, you have in international comparisons, very, very low smoking prevalence in kids in the US compared to most European countries. But Jean well, I would not, I give you the, I just finished the argument here by saying that these data are no proof either for or against uh, the gateway theory. You know, it's because this decrease in new smoking prevalence can be due to other causes. And, and of course, the usual suspect is uh, smartphones and social media, because teens also drink less. They start having sex later, possibly because they don't go out and stay home uh, talking to their friends on their smartphone. Yes. Uh, before I ask the question. So for those of you who want to ask questions, you can use the Q&A um, button. Uh, we'll share all questions with the presenter afterwards, regardless of whether we have time to cover it. Um, and we might have to be selective due to uh, time. Uh, one question that, that's come up from a couple people are trying to understand what are the health risks of nicotine addiction only. And relatedly, that someone was commenting that, you know, there have been systematic reviews showing harmful effects of nicotine in different age groups. Uh, in, in also pointing to brain, cardiovascular system, and other, other types of organs that are affected. Um, oh, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, well, I'm a political scientist. I'm not a biologist or a physician. I suggest you invite Neil Benovitz to answer this question once. Uh, me, uh, in the 2014 Surgeon General Report, we took this up in a specific, in the, in the chapter uh, on nicotine, nicotine risk, and, and, and the evidence uh, supported by NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse in the U.S., has, has advanced that, and there is a, uh, uh, a growing and uh, uh, substantial literature, uh, so highly supported by, uh, uh, by NIDA, of the unique and long-term effects of nicotine on adolescent brain development. Uh, and uh, the magnitudes of these effects and the uh, long-term sequelae are still being uh, uh, nailed down, but uh, among, uh, I would say, uh, a substantial portion of the uh, addiction research community, there is uh, substantial con concurrence on the fact that all stimulant drugs affect the adolescent brain development and impulsivity and other long-term uh, negative effects in terms of educational attainment. Uh, and that uh, nicotine is following in concurrence with uh, what we've seen with the, uh, the other stimulant drugs. So is there a reliable impact on uh, adolescent brain development independent of the other toxicities of tobacco smoke? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And then um, 
Let's examine the next viewpoint, the analogy. Do similar agents act similarly? Let's take nicotine medications, nicotine patches and gums. Uh, they deliver nicotine rather slower to the brain than inhaled products and therefore are less addictive than anything that is inhaled. Uh, but there's no reported case, as far as I know, of non-users of tobacco who got addicted to nicotine gum and then switched to smoking to satisfy uh, this addiction. As for smokeless tobacco, it delivers large amounts of nicotine and it is addictive. There are reviews that examine a possible uh, gateway effect, but they say that smokeless uh, does not appear to be a gateway to smoking. And of course, smoking prevalence in uh, many countries, not all uh, countries where smokeless is, is popular, but in Sweden, for instance, smoking prevalence among men is extremely slow, low and, and decreased uh, after snooze became uh, popular in, in recent decades. Um, I'm gonna jump this one and these ones because uh, we'll we be short of time and, and uh, come to an important point. What we need is comprehensive causal models between the different behaviors that we're talking about. Smoking, vaping, using smokeless tobacco or heated tobacco product or using no product at all. Um, the gateway theory, I think, is very narrow, narrowly focused on just one of the multiple pathways that we're talking about. And what we need is a more global, a more comprehensive model that explains the movements in all directions. I, I have a slide illustrating this uh, in a minute, not just from vaping to smoking. So we need these complex multi-directional causal models that allow also for a non-linear sequence of behavior over time. That is people who try a product, then stop, then use another product, then use a third product. So these complex models should be uh, developed. And also the simple use of this word, the, the causing, uh, I mean, calling a model, a gateway model, reflects a selective and a partial view, and in fact, a polemical view uh, of this complex question. You know, it, you, you select one of the pathways and then you call it a gateway effect. It's, uh, it's something that can be viewed as polemical. So I think that this, this issue should be approached as a harm reduction approach. You have uh, here the three uh, traffic lights. The, uh, it's better, of course, to have the largest possible number of people here. Uh, they, they use none of these products, no nicotine products at all. Yes, it, it's, it's better. And of course, we want as few people as possible who use the most dangerous product, combustion, because in this field, most of the mortality or the mortality is caused by combustion rather than by nicotine itself. It's combustion, the problem. And then of course you have uh, in the middle all sorts of nicotine products, medications, vaporizers, oral tobacco, heated tobacco products, etc. And what we need, and I draw this from the models of uh, David Levi and David Abrams, is a comprehensive model that examines the, uh, the flow uh, and stocks of people between all the possible uh, here uh, products. We want people to stop smoking, so we want people to go in this direction, to stop smoking and use either less dangerous product or use nothing at all. Of course, we want as few people as possible uh, along this pathway, the pathway from not using anything to vaping uh, and then to smoking. This is the gateway theory, but we need to understand, and it's, it's a very important point, that if you change anything in this complex system, then you're going to have an effect on all the arrows, not just on the arrows in this direction. For instance, if you prohibit flavors, or if you limit the amount of nicotine that people can obtain, or if you 
put any limitations on, on marketing, etc., you may have an effect uh, uh, on, the, on the number of non-smokers who switch to vaping and then to smoking, but we, you will also have an effect, an unintended effect, on the number of people who go from smoking to vaping or using smokeless tobacco and, and then to using no products at all. If you make the products less attractive to, to teenagers, you also make them less attractive to adult smokers. So uh, it, my point is that it's important uh, when you discuss any policy measures or any intervention to have in mind this complex model here and think if I do this or that, if I prohibit flavors or if I prohibit advertisement, what will be the effect on, uh, on smokers? What will be the effects on users of oral tobacco or heated tobacco? Am I going to increase the number of them who uh, switch to, to vaping or switch to uh, or stop smoking? Or am I going to increase the number of smokers because the alternative, the competitive, because I kill the competition? You know, basically, if you if you kill the competition, then you favor cigarettes. So th this is, I think, a central a central point. There are a couple of papers that I invite you to read by Dave Abrams and, and David Levi, who examine these things um, and describe uh, uh, these comprehensive models. They actually have put uh, figures uh, on all these arrows. So, um, what sort of studies do we need to establish whether or not there is a gateway effect? What sort of new studies? I think there is no need for additional and he often heavily advertised studies of antecedents and increased relative risk based on secondary analysis of existing surveys. We have a lot of these already, a lot of these uh, studies with just increased relative risk and antecedents, uh, an incomplete measurement and adjustment for confounders. No more need for this, I think. What we need is large studies that are specifically designed and that are longitudinal and that measure confounders comprehensively and repeatedly to assess the onset of smoking, that is a non-repeatable event. As uh, Che said, we need studies based on propensity scoring to establish whether vaping predicts, predicts smoking above a, a measure of uh, liability to smoke. This was used uh, for smokeless tobacco. We need randomized trials of vaping cessation in young smokers. I don't know whether, in, in young non-smokers, for instance, vapors who don't smoke, you, you take them and you randomize them to an intervention that uh, helps them stop vaping. And then you look at whether or not uh, this intervention also decreases the number of smokers among them after one year, for instance. Natural experiments. Uh, that is the, uh uh, Jean, that is feasible, and the Truth Initiative is actually running some uh, randomized trials, online randomized trials of uh, vaping cessation in adolescents and young adults. Quite feasible. Uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. As we said, natural experiments of the effects of regulations, for instance, uh, ban, uh, bans uh, on cigarette sales or, or taxation, etc. Intervention studies that test the effect of education, for instance, does delaying the age at uh, first vaping also delay the age at, at first smoking, and uh, experiments in animals, studies of twins. I would like to come back to an important point, and it's the balance between the interests of current adult smokers and young uh, non-smokers. Uh, there's reasonable evidence, especially the trial by Peter Hajak, uh, to say that uh, vaping helps people quit smoking, even though uh, the, uh, the reviews that I list here conclude that the quality and the generalizability 
of much of the uh, of the studies is is low, but still, uh, gateway effects will need to be very large in order to counteract the effects of e-cigarettes on smoking cessation. You know, there's a reasonable effect of vaping on smoking cessation on one hand, and on the other hand, a possible effect of vaping on smoking initiation. But this second effect, we need to be very large to counteract uh, the effect on smoking cessation. And there's also another point raised by Ken Warner. He, he thinks that smoking initiation today, in the US at least, is, an, is unlikely to cause much health damage in 40 years from now because smoking prevalence is already very low in, in teenagers and is likely to decline further. So for this reason, because smoking is initiation is unlikely to cause much health damage uh, down the road 40 years from now, it's more urgent to decrease the number of current smokers uh, than to address the problem of uh, smoking initiation. Also, uh, I think we would need a better consensus uh, among legislators, etc., on the level of population risk above which action is required. Is any small effect sufficient to justify very strong interventions uh, against e-cigarettes? And what is the size of the, of the problem that requires action? Sometimes I think we forget this, that, that we, we don't want any kid at all to start vaping or start smoking. But in the real world, they will start smoking. Uh, so what is the level of this gateway effect that is uh, unacceptable? If there is a gateway effect, what size of this effect do we need to, can we tolerate and what size can we not tolerate? There's a need for a, a debate and a consensus on, on this. Um, yes. Um, so, as I, as I said, there's a, there are potential adverse consequences of these uh, strong measures against vaping. And, uh, and uh, yes, this trade-off should be debated and discussed. I, I, I think that much of the time it's not discussed comprehensively enough. Uh, we have only seven more minutes, so uh, the, the conclusion slides largely repeat what I already said, I, I think. And uh, so I'd like to uh, take a few more questions in the last, uh, in the last few minutes, instead of repeating the, the conclusions that are, that are things that are already said. Yes. Questions Thanks, from the audience? Thank you very much for that great presentation. I, I do have a few questions. I'm going to try to group these because um, some of them are related. Um, one is asking about the uh, terminology around transitions versus gateways and trying to draw a distinction between those two and thinking about, um, in particular, the proximity of the two behaviors initiating at, the, at similar time makes it difficult to study and uh, wondering if it's easier to think about um, gateway effects for something like vaping to marijuana use instead and how you might think about that. And in particular, again, coming back to the proximity of the two behaviors, um, is there a role for other possible, so especially because policies that like vaping taxes or cigarette taxes affect both of these nicotine behaviors, is there a role for other measures that might uh, identify one behavior but not the other? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, what we need is uh, clever regulations proportionate to the risk of, uh, of, of the products. Uh, one thing that has been proposed by Frank Chalupka and also Ken Warner is uh, a, continuous, a continuum of taxation that reflects the continuum of risk between products. Products that are more dangerous, combustible products, should be taxed higher than products that are less dangerous. So this is uh, what we need is, is a measure that discriminates between products and don't regulate all nicotine products the same way because the justification of these regulation is to protect, protect public health. Uh, and if you, and you may have adverse consequences if you, uh, if you kill the competitors to cigarettes because it's what's 
happening in many cases. The, the, uh, cigarettes are really extremely dangerous and now there's a competition, but I fear that much of the regulation just kills the competition. So you protect the cigarette market if you do that. Uh, uh, and the, the debate is really passionate and very ideological. And there are some very vocal uh, advocates of one side or, or the other. But it's in this context of such a passionate debate, it's very hard to keep a cold uh, mind and uh, suggest measures that are reasonable, proportionate, and that really target the problem instead of, uh, instead of killing the competition to cigarettes. Yes, and one of the things to realize that FDA is fully aware of, but legally restricted on, is that it cannot degrade uh, the cigarette. But we fully understand that we're in a situation where uh, these uh, newer uh, products are competing against an incredibly high target of an uh, of a, uh, incredibly uh, well-engineered, highly effective drug delivery device, which we call the cigarette, uh, which is really a drug delivery device of, a, of incredible efficiency uh, in terms of other additives beyond nicotine. And therefore, uh, w one of the issues that we go all the way back to, why are we concerned, is that the, uh, the vaping uh, finds those uh, sub population of adolescents who, quote, like uh, the drug effect of nicotine because there is a variation in brain liking, uh, then uh, we're in a situation where they will continue to seek the most efficient delivery device, which continues to be the cigarette. So the, you know, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, we are uh, dealing with a, a level playing field, we're not. Until we price the cigarettes at the level of their harm and regulate them to, re to reduce their uh, addictiveness, we're in an un unfair playing field. And both of those things are feasible. As I say, we, uh, right now, FDA in the US and, and uh, other scientists around the world know how to degrade the cigarette. We could just raise the pH on the nicotine delivery though. We could, we could uh, ban all the MAO, uh, all the other chemicals that enhance the nicotine effect in the cigarette, we could in, we could change the ventilation structure. We could do a lot of things that make the cigarette uh, less attractive, and therefore uh, less uh, likely to encourage those uh, those minority of youth exposed uh, to nicotine and vaping uh, to seek the best delivery device. Anyway, it's becomes as this model up here. It's a it is not a unidirectional and has to fully understand the interplay of the multiple products. Right, Gene? Yeah, so thank you very much, yes, very, very relevant. And uh, in the last few minutes, I wanted to raise another point that we have not yet discussed, the question of mental health and nicotine. Nicotine is a stimulant, and I don't know if you have met vapors or, or if you went to vape fast and and uh, what strikes me is that many of the, uh, of the people who vape uh, actually use nicotine as a stimulant and, and have a background, uh, not all of them, I'm not saying that everybody who vapes has mental health problems, but it's more prevalent, of course. Mental health problems are more prevalent among people who use substances, including nicotine, than in the general population. And a lot of people use nicotine to manage psychiatric symptoms. So by putting hardness on them, I mean, by taxing these products very highly. Uh, we're targeting with negative measures like taxes, prohibitions, etc., all sorts of pressures. We're putting pressure on a population that uses nicotine to manage uh, their mood. Uh, I think it's an important point. A lot of people need nicotine because otherwise they have negative psychiatric symptoms that, that, that come, you know, depressed mood, et cetera, anxiety. They, 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 they use nicotine for this purpose. And so this also needs to be taken account into the equation. It's a kind, some people even say that it's their right, there's a kind of human right to use nicotine. We cannot prohibit them to, to use nicotine because they need it. They, they can't they have difficulty living. Of course, they could stop vaping, and, but it would be very difficult and more difficult for them to stop 
using nicotine, either vaped or smoked, than for the uh, person who does not have mental health problems. We are out of time. Thank you so much for the, for the presentation. And thank you as well, uh, moderator and discussants. Uh, finally, thank you to the audience for your participation. Over 110 people attended the seminar today, uh, which seems like a great turnout for the first seminar in the series. Jody Sindelar of Yale University will be our next seminar speaker on September 18th. In the meantime, please submit your research on tobaccopolicy.org, and please tell your colleagues to sign up for our email list. You can email us at tobaccopolicy at gmail.com if you have any feedback on today's session. Thanks again for participating, and have a top notch weekend. Thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed it uh, very much. So thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean-François. Thank you. It was a real pleasure.